gitu. Um, so good evening everyone. Um, I'm Tris from the PIDC 2021 Adjudication Core. So for tonight, my lecture is going to focus on case preparation for AP debating, which is um, the format for PIDC, of course. So this is how the presentation will go. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first, I'll set some reminders, and then I'm going to go to the meat of the discussion, which is the case preparation and the strategies for it. And then lastly, I'm going to summarize the lecture and provide some key takeaways. Next, please. So um, for the reminders, the first thing is that if you have a case preparation strategy that already works for your team, feel free to stick to that. So this is intended to, for those who are looking for a blueprint that they can use until they already have or until they master their personal prep strategy or those looking for new methods that they can incorporate in their existing prep strategy. So majority of the content of this lecture is based from my own years of experience and lessons that I picked up along the way from other debaters. So if it's different from yours or you prefer another strategy, no worries, that's totally up to you. So the last reminder is that there are actually a lot of re resources that are existing that you can check online regarding the elements of prep. So for example, I incorporated materials from the Nordic Debate Academy 2018 um, debate tutorials. It is posted in the Athens EUDC 2019 Facebook page in case you want to check out other resources. Next, please. Um, so uh, after that, we can now proceed to the main point of the discussion, which is how to efficiently and effectively use the time allotted for case preparation in Asian parliamentary debating. So um, preparation or prep is a crucial part of how great or how terrible a team performs in a round. So um, usually bad prep results to bad performance in rounds. And an integral part of prep is building the case for the first speaker. And if you notice, um, that is the, there, there are cases where um, both um, the deputy and whips generally will have to refer in their own speeches until the end of the debate to that first speech, right? So which means that the effects of a not so good prep will linger until the last speakers of your team. Like I know deputy or whip can maybe rebuild or can repackage the case lines better. But again, speaking from years of experience and observation, when other speakers in the team do that, then what happens is they lack the time to do or fulfill their actual burdens in the round, such as extend for deputies or break deadlocks and respond further in whips. So in short, um, to make the entire case line um, and the lives of the entire team better and easier, the prep has to go well. So that is what we are here for. Next, please. Hmm. So the first concept I would like to discuss under prep strategy is in terms of prep roles, specifically the particular role of the prep master. Um, through the Google Forms from the PIDC Orgcom, there was one question submitted. So the person asked, how is BP prep different from AP prep? So the major difference is in terms of time allotted, differences, time allotted, and number of people involved. So AP prep is 30 minutes, which is wonderful if you make use of it efficiently. There are three people thinking, which again is wonderful if the flow is organized. Which brings me to the heading of this slide, which is prep rules. So I think there's no need for a strict delegation for each team member na, oh, um, 
like ikaw, you do the initial arguments, I do the extensions, and this this person thinks of what the other side may argue. Because I think that a good prep is a collaborative prep. Next, please. But in order to do a collaborative prep, there is a need to delegate a prep master. So this can be anyone in the team, given that or if they fulfill these qualifications. So first, um, the prep master is someone who can effectively facilitate the collaboration. Second, this person has a clear sense of direction on where the prep should go. And lastly, and this is not as essential as the first two, but it would be great if the prep master can do this too. So this is someone who can remain calm, who is focused, and can help handle the emotions of everyone in the team. So I know this sounds like a tall order. Honestly, it is. So of course, we're only human. We also err. And at times, we may not meet all of these qualifications. But the person assigned as prep master in the team is the person who can meet these qualifications more than anyone in the team. So comparatively. And if all else fails, that's the reason why there are trainings and there are tune-up debates because practice makes teams better. So let's discuss each quote-unquote qualification um, for the prep master more extensively. So let's go to the first one. The first one is that the prep master is the one who facilitates the discussion. So in a sense that this person is the one who goes, oh, I think these are the words that we have to define first, or the person who talks to everyone and goes, oh, what do you think? How about you? So this is the person who engages everyone. So or when the flow is, for example, already good for the first argument, like if you already have the first argument locked and loaded, this is the person um, who helps or initiates the building of the second argument. So the reason why it's important that someone facilitates the discussion is that absent this person, the tendency is either of the two. So first, you all wait on each other. Who would speak first? Who will say something and that wastes a lot of time but the second tendency is that there's this one person who dominates the prep even if the other people didn't ask this person to dominate the prep so on an emotional level that builds resentment among teammates and on a strategy level the better forms of arguments may not resurface or may not surface because there's only one person dominating the discussion so in essence, for the first qualification, the prep master engages everyone and pushes the collaboration to happen during prep. So for the second one, um, there is a tendency for debaters to be disorganized in prep. So for example, you are at the world building part of the prep. So you're building your policy, ganyan. And then one teammate would go, you know what? I think this would be a great extension, blah, blah, blah. Or like someone says, oh my God, what if the other team argues this? And this is not to say that those ideas are bad or that is bad. This is to say that if prep has no structure, then you also go in the round with no structure. So this may mean that the first speaker goes straight to arguments without world building or that the key parts of, argu of the arguments are missing. So the role of the prep master is to pull everybody back in. So they should know the general direction of the prep um, and stick with that. So if a teammate is discussing an extension during the discussion of the policy, the prep master is the one who goes, you know, I appreciate that, but maybe you can write it down first while we... Um, focus on wrapping up the policy. Then later on, at the discussion for extension, you can bring it back by saying, oh, I remember you had that idea for an extension. Maybe we can discuss it now. So in the next slides, I will further talk about the said um, prep structure. But then um, the last, and like I said earlier, desirable qualifications for the prep master, um, which is not as essential, are these things, right? 
because in major tournaments like PIDC, teams can be very emotional and can be very in their heads. And all that can have a negative impact on the prep. So when someone in the team is in their feelings, it's the prep master who can go, you know what, let's go back, let's focus, we can do this, and let's not worry about what the other team will argue first, um, but what we should argue instead. So this is why if you're going to set roles for your team, I think um, the most crucial role that you will set, and the yeah, the most crucial role is the role of the prep master. So, of course, everyone should contribute, right? So if you have a bad prep, or if you lose rounds, this does not mean that it's the fault of the prep master. It is always a team effort. So the only point of having this role is that it enables a more effective and a more efficient use of the time allotted for prep. So before I proceed to prep structure, um, and if there's anything unclear about the prep master role, you can write down your questions and the orcom will forward it here and it will answer it like in the middle of the lecture. Next, please. Okay, so as you can see, here is a sample prep structure that we will refer to for the remaining parts of my lecture. So um, this is a pattern that you can use both as a prep master and like all the other members of the team for you to be able to use prep time as efficiently as possible. So having this will help you manage your time better so that when you can't, oh, so, <clears throat> sorry, so when you are in the round, you have all the bases covered because they were addressed during prep. Um, of course, if you need more or if you need less time for each part, it's up to you. Like, say you need more time for arguments and less time for world building, that's up to you. So as you can see, um, everyone is involved in the team building, uh, sorry, in the world building part of the prep. So this is because of two reasons. So one, um, everyone has to be on the same page regarding the foundation um, of the case line. And secondly, everyone has or should have a clear idea of the direction of the case line. So that's why everyone is involved there. So after world building, the first and second speaker or the first and third speaker, this can be up to you again, can discuss the first argument while the remaining speaker at the same time works on the second argument. And then they can switch, as you can see in the next part, until the remaining two speakers builds the extension at the end. So after two to three arguments, you give the first speaker time to work on their speech while the remaining speakers work on the extension. So for the wrap up, everyone is involved as well. So this is uh, where you give bits of analysis that you suddenly remembered or you ask for clarifications. So again, this is only a pattern and if any, of the speakers wants to ask for clarification or bring up new material at any point of the prep, that can be welcomed. And the team, especially the prep master, just has to be organized so that you don't spend so much time discussing something to the point that it leaves no room for discussion of the other elements of the case line. So now that we have a prep structure that we can refer to, we can tackle the specific prep functions. So again, if something is unclear about the prep structure, you can always like ask a question. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so now, now that we have the prep structure, we can go discuss the start of the prep or if you, get, if you revert back to the prep stru structure, that's the world building part of the prep. So um, the first one at the start of the prep after there's a veto already. So it's thinking time. So by thinking time, it means you take a pause as individuals to first write down your initial ideas that you can collate later and discuss further later. So usually when nationals used to be um, 
before the pandemic so usually debaters do this while walking from rooms to, from room to room but since it's an online setup maybe like one minute a minute or two of silence is enough to facilitate the thinking time and the second thing that you have to do in prep after your individual thinking time is to build the world um so what I've noticed both from debating and judging is that a lot of teams have a tendency to go straight to arguments and not build the world at all. And that is not good for three reasons. So first, there are a lot of questions that still needs to be answered for everyone in the room to understand where the foundations and the context of your arguments lie. So the second reason why it's not good to go straight to the arguments is that it leaves room for attacks from other teams. Like they can easily say, oh, like Gov was so unclear. They did not even answer why X, Y, Z, and et cetera. And the third is that it takes time from other speakers in your team um, to rebuild if these things are missing, if the context, if the foundation is missing. It takes time from them, so it prevents them from doing their jobs. So, like I know that the next speakers can rebuild, but why rebuild when you can, you know, spend your time doing your actual job in the round? So, um, essentially, not building the world first before arguing hurts your team. Next, please. So, since I talked about how world building is so important. I want to actually spend more time talking about what do I mean by world building. So what I mean is that um, first, um, the reason why you have to spend time building the world is because this is the foundation of the entire case line. So this is what all speakers until reply will tie back to to prove the importance of the case line. So many debaters go as far as providing good arguments, but they fail to contextualize why they matter in the debate more than the case line of their opponents. So one of the best ways to lay it down is at the start of PM's or LO speech. So what does it mean to build the world, right? So essentially, it includes framing and all these other things. So I would like to introduce um, four main concepts that you can um add, if you haven't, to your world building during prep and during the speeches of the first speakers. So first is you have to contextualize the debate first. So what is the problem? Like, what is the problem behind the motion or what is the problem that the motion is trying to solve? Or what is the conflict, right? So for prime minister, this is where you go, oh, like, status quo is so bad and here are the solutions to solve it. Or this current world is so bad and here are the examples of why it's bad and for lo this is the part where you go either oh you know it's not so bad because xyz or maybe okay we agree it's bad but here are other solutions or examples that are different and that are better than the things pm presented so this is also the part where you can define the operational terms in the round to provide further context so um, the next thing after um, contextualizing the debate is discussing the goal. So given all that context that you presented, what is your goal then as a team? So you can discuss here who stands to benefit with your goal and why should they be the ones to benefit from that specific goal. And then the next is the policy. This depends on the kind of motion, right? So sometimes you would need a policy. Sometimes you would need to establish a world, to picture paint what the world looks like, to give a lot of examples of whether it's good or bad. So, um, okay, so um, it's important. So the important comparisons can be briefly made in policy as well. Like at the start of the policy, we don't just, you don't just discuss what you're going to do. You can start discussing why it's gonna much gonna, it's gonna be much better than all the policies that your opponents are going to present in the round. And then the last thing that you can discuss is what trade-off are you going to make? So in debates, there are sometimes accusations to either government or opposition about, oh, you know, they're using a, a, a magic wand because like just because they had a policy, they're acting like there's nothing bad that can happen in their world. So thinking of the trade-off during prep 
and analyzing it during the first speakers makes the first speaker speakers as engaging as possible and it leaves less room for other um for other teams to accuse you of painting this world that is too perfect um to be true so yeah so that's what i mean by world building next please okay so now that we've covered um the start of the prep i'm going to discuss the middle of the prep so now that you have built your world the next thing you're going to do is build your arguments so for this lecture I will not discuss how you should argue or what makes a good argument. Since this is case prep, I'm going to focus on how do you strategize on which arguments to prioritize discussing during prep. So this is where the team members can diverge for efficiency. So like um, I showed in the sample prep structure that you can look at, um, this is where team members, like for example, si prep master and si first speaker, they work on the first argument and then the other speaker already builds the second argument and then they exchange and then they think of the extension, etc. So that's a general flow, right? So the first thing to look for when you're in the middle of the prep and thinking of the argument is that you have to answer the fundamental questions first, right? So what are fundamental questions and how do we know these are the fundamental questions? So the fundamental questions are usually either these are principled arguments, so more on, a, one, a defense on why in all contexts your arguments or your model stands, right? So why is this principally true? Why is this principally just? So that's one way to go about it. The second way to assess whether or not the argument answers a fundamental question is that these fundamental questions are most often than not embedded in the wording of motions, right? So terms like banning, so when do we ban? Words like more harm than good. So you know that those are the things that you have to um, discuss. So if there's a key term that says prioritize, most likely that assumes a degree of conflict, right? Or when you're talking about a specific actor, like this house as the US or this house as the UN. So then you would have to like have an argument as early as the first speaker about the interests of these people because the debate is about them or if it's about a specific event, right? So again, so for fundamental questions, they're either usually general principles or operational words that you can find in the motions. So after you've covered the fundamental questions for first speaker, the next thing that you would um, have to discuss is the extensions or the elevations in the round. So a general tip, especially for Asians, right? So for Asians, if you do not have an extension and if you do not have an elevation for the second speaker, judges can tell. Like, it's very clear since it's just two teams in the room. So it's very important to work on thinking of extensions. So um, I know there are a lot of material out there in terms of how to think of extensions and how to make good extensions. So my point here of mentioning extensions is that in AP, during prep, you have to discuss already what makes it clear that this extension is an elevation of the round and why is it important. So this is because so that, this is because so that, so para si um deputies when they go in the round when they discuss their extensions they can easily point out what makes this an elevation how does this elevate the round and how does this make our team more dynamic because that is the, one of the fundamental goals of the deputy speaker so the last thing is in terms of preemption so when you're thinking of arguments or extensions it's very important to think of preemptions as well in terms of how do we think the opponents will respond to this. And the reason why you should think about this in prep is that it strengthens the argument, it strengthens the case line because you can add barriers against their attack as early as prep. So um, so yeah, you can incorporate incorporate this in terms of arguments, but also in terms of the world building palang. Like even in policy, you can already preempt there. Next, please. So before we go to the end part of the prep, I would like to introduce first um, some um, pointers 
in terms of argumentation and making arguments. Um, so the first pointer is there's no need to go word per word when you're discussing the arguments to your first speaker, especially. And this is because in prep, it's better to use a skeleton or an outline of the argument that later, that later on, the constructive speakers can fill out. So this means that the discussion involves, um, so what is the label of the argument? What is the main goal of the argument? What is the main layer of analysis? And what is the conclusion? So you discuss these things, the fundamental parts of the argument, but not word for word. So why not word for word? It's because number one, it takes up so much of your time. So again, going back to my point of um, losing the time to discuss the other fundamental parts of the speeches and the prep time. But secondly, on a strategy level, it leaves room for a lot of misunderstanding. Because if you are not the person who will say those arguments, but the words come from you, it may not be articulated as well as they can be had the words come naturally from the person who will speak them. So let the person who will speak articulate the words using their own so that they can, they can say it like easier and so that you are assured that they actually understand what the what the entire team wants to come out of prep. So yon. So the second is do not get stuck in playing the devil's advocate. Like like I said earlier, it's nice to have a preemption, right? But there's a difference between strategically preempting versus spending like half of the prep time thinking about, oh, our opponents may be too good. They might think this and we don't know how to respond. They might think of better arguments, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you do this, instead of helping the case, as intended in my previous slides, it will hurt your team. If you think so much about what the other team will argue or how, will, how they will rebut you, then you will lose time building your case. So in prep, and the point of these two reminders is that time is very essential and avoiding these common pitfalls will save you time. Next, please. Okay, so um, so we're here now at the end of the prep time. So at the end of the prep time, so the last three minutes or five minutes, if you're lucky, um, this is where you wrap up, all right? So when you are wrapping up, these are the things that you should or you can consider as a team. So first, this is where you can add um, final additions and um, final additions and final uh, clarifications. So maybe this is where you can raise, oh, were there keywords that we missed out on? Was there a part of an analysis that was incomplete? Um, this is also the part where you can make sure that you are on the same page to avoid having an inconsistent team stance or contradictory arguments. So this is the time where you can, where anyone should raise any confusion or uncertainty. So this is where the prep master is again important in engaging everyone, right? So they can start asking questions. Oh, so is everything clear? Are there any, any hesitations at this point? Are there, yon, so hesitations, is anything clear, etc. So, yon. And then the next is, do not cram. So, if you thought suddenly of a great argument that you think PM or LO should argue, or you thought an, of an entirely new frame that you think is so good in the dying minutes of your prep, you shouldn't, like, I suggest you don't push it or you don't push for it because if it is, if it was thought of in the last few minutes of prep, what happens is, number one, it's probably not well built. And two, it will only stress out your first speaker. And it will most likely show in how they deliver their speech. So, yeah, so make final clarifications, final additions, but don't like risk cramming stuff. So next, please. Okay, um, next and next all after this key takeaway slide. Yeah, thank you. So um, so we are here now in the like key takeaway.
takeaways or the final pointers of my discussion. Sorry, of my discussion. So the first is the first key takeaway is that one, you have to be very organized in prep. So in prep, time is the currency. So the more time you have, the more you can use that to firm up the entire case line. So you have to be organized. You have to have a prep structure that works. And you have to follow that prep structure. And your prep master should be able to pull the teammates back in if they are being disorganized. Second is, I cannot stress enough how important it is to build the world first before building the arguments. Because the world building is the foundation of the entire case line. This is because it contextualizes the arguments and the responses and it answers the questions of the debate that are not part of the arguments, such as the goals, the most important actors, among others. So, yon, you really have to build the world first. The second is, in terms of prioritizing arguments that are discussed in prep, a lot more time for the arguments that answer the fundamental questions of the debate especially for the arguments of the first speakers. And then the fourth is everyone should speak. So it has to be collaborative. So regardless, if it's a contribution, if it's a question, if it's a concern, everyone should speak up, right? Because only when we, can, only when we communicate can we address the issues of each other. So, if you don't bring up an argument that you're thinking of during prep because you're afraid that it's the wrong argument, but like, what if it's actually good? Or if it isn't good, then your teammates can shut it down anyway, right? So if you don't ask for clarification in prep, it may lead you to explaining your arguments or your extensions in a way that hurts your team's case. So, if you are afraid of saying the wrong thing in prep, you can think of it this way. It's better to make a mistake or make mistakes in front of my teammates than to make one mistake or multiple mistakes in front of strangers or in front of my opponents that may hurt not only my feelings, but the possibility of our chance or like our chances of winning. So don't be afraid to speak up in prep. And then the fifth um, key takeaway is that you have to trust your teammate. Um, there are instances where the lack of trust in your teammate will lead to one, fighting, and two, being disorganized, both in prep and during the round. So if you don't trust that your teammate is doing at least their best for the team, you are more likely going to do three things that will hurt your not only your prep, but your entire case line. So if you don't trust your teammates, number one, you're more likely going to spoon feed them word for word, which will take too much of prep time. And I already said why this is harmful. And second, you may unstrategically drop them during the round and hurt your case and open it up for a lot of attacks from your opponents. And number three, you're going to spend so much time rebuilding them in your speech. Even if they did good in their speech or even if they did bad because you don't trust them, you spend so much of your time rebuilding them in your speech that you are unable to do your actual job. So the point is trusting your teammate and being open about your concerns helps avoid all those things that all those horrible things that I mentioned. Also remember, especially for majors and the particular tournament we're talking about, PIDC, you will be with these people for seven or more rounds. So you might as well help create an environment that you all don't want to escape. Because debate is hard enough already. So let's not make it harder by making the team dynamics horrible. But there's a caveat to this um, specific key takeaway, right? So obviously, this refers to the majority of instances, right? So I would like to make it clear that um, if your partner or if your partners, if your teammates are abusive or they cause harm, 
you should not accept this, right? Just for the sake of team dynamics. You can raise such concerns to your org officers, to your alumni, or other channels you may deem proper. But for the majority of instances where there are no cases of abuse or no cases of harm, it's better and strategic for the prep, for the rounds, and for the entire tournament to put some level of trust in your teammates. So lastly, and I don't think this goes without saying, is that you should train and train a lot. Because the more you train, the more you get familiar, the more you get comfortable, and the easier it is for you to build better strategies with your teammates to make your prep time more efficient and more effective, which is the goal of debates and of this lecture. I know a lot of teams where, and a lot of team, other teams and teams from my personal experience that it really took years to build good prep uh, team dynamics, but it's good because the better the team dynamics is, the easier the flow of the prep is, and it really shows in the round. So that is all. I hope that um, you learned a lot from this lecture. Thank you for your time. And I hope this helps you for the next tournament, especially nationals. And your questions on our YouTube live stream comment section. So the first question that we oh, oh wait, the live stream stopped. Yeah. Oh. Wait long. Well. Oh. Okay, we're now live again. So yeah, allow me to read the questions that we received through our Google form and also this to remind our live audience that they can send their questions on our YouTube live stream comment section. So the first question that we received is an anonymous question, how to prep in motions we have no knowledge on? Mm, how to prep in motions you have no knowledge of. So, I'd be, okay, so if you go back to my lecture, like. Like I said, at the start of the prep, I establish guidelines or patterns that you can follow at the start, in the middle, or the end. So at the start, it says here, build the world first, right? And then I explained how you build the world first. The thing is, even if you don't know a lot, um, this is where and building you have banning something is it about um doing more harm than good and another thing that you can look on in terms of the theme right so is this about sports what are the gen what are the general issues about the environment right so that's for the world building part and in terms of the argument part so let's say you know nothing about this motion right this is where you can, again, apply what I previously said. One, look at the operative terms in the motion and make an argument out of that. So if it's a banning motion or a prohibit prohibiting motion, when do we prohibit something? If it's, um, let's say, um, a taxation motion, and tax something, right? So there are a lot of principles in general arguments that you can already make just from the operative terms of the motion. But secondly, if not the operative words of the motion, the theme of the motion can also help you. So if it's about feminism, motion is about feminism. What do we usually talk about when we discuss feminism? Then that's something that you can use. So I hope that answers the question. So first, use the operational words or operative terms. And then next, derive a lot from the theme of the motion. All right. Uh, thank you. For the second question, it's also an anonymous question. How would we determine who's taking which role in prep? Okay, so... Um, like I said earlier, um, um, I don't think there's a need to have a strict delegation that this one person does this specific thing. I think that the important role that you need to decide on really is the prep master. And then you can go back, 
later sa part where I discuss what the prep master should be able to do to qualify for that role. And like I said, maybe hindi naman siya perfect and maybe hindi niya like kuha lahat ng qualifications but this person should be out of everyone in the team siya yung closest possible to those qualifications all right i think that is all the question that oh wait yeah i think those are all the questions okay. that we see for the topic thank you so much tris uh, for all those who are viewing this uh we are also inviting Thank you to watch our lecture series on adjudication and international relations in the upcoming days. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you.